my name is Marty, but you can coach Marty, I guess. I'm the coach. You're the team, correct? The owner of the team, based on the metaphor, would be God or the Trinity, whatever you want to say. So we'll, we'll come at it with that motif. So I don't have some major homiletical idea. Uh, this is just a chalk talk. So I want to cover just four questions as the coach. Locker room, it's halftime, correct? And, uh, and it's time to talk about how things are going so we can look to the future as we head out back onto the field. So I have, uh, I want to start uh, with the business stuff first, but it's not just business. It is, it's really a spiritual thing. Uh, and the question is, how is our giving? Now, we're in a unique team because we, we play on the team, but we also kind of, well, we kind of own the team because we give to the team, correct? So that's an unusual relationship. Um, if we were a pro team, no pro player is, is contributing back to the team. He, he's not like an owner, but we are, God's given us a unique role. So we are players and we are participants in how we support what God is doing. So I, I want to talk about our giving. Uh, and I, I'm not talking about um, your sacrifice, your personal sacrifice to the body inside the building, your sacrifice outside the, the body. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, but that is stellar. The commitment of the church is amazing. In fact, when I watch you work, because I do pay attention, there's a lot of our people who are here when there's no one else here. They're here doing things, uh, technical things and stuff, volunteering their time. I see the time that you put into the children's ministry, etc. So when I look at the church from a giving perspective of giving of their time and, uh, and talents to Christ, I think of 1 Corinthians 9, which is also a, 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 um, a sports motif from Paul. He says... Uh, he switches from a base, uh, from a football to uh, to track. In, in case you like track, uh, don't you know? Paul says that those who run the race. He's speaking to Christians. They all run, but notice there's a contrast. But only one receives the prize. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about rewards at the at the judgment seat of Christ when he rewards saints. First Corinthians three, by the way. But only one receives the prize. Then he says, based upon the fact you're going to be rewarded for how well you ran the spiritual race, he then says, gives you some advice as a coach. What does he tell you? Well, you better run in such a way you can win. Does God like winners? Are you praying about it? Does, does God like a winning team? It was pretty simple. It's a softball question. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, it, it, Paul says he does. So if you're a Christian, um, you know, my family's all uh, basically from uh, the South Carolina. My dad, you know, joined the Navy in the uh, Korean War. After the war, uh, stayed, in, stayed in California. But the family's really from the South. Um, my mom's from Arkansas, et cetera. So down there, if you go after something, they call it going after it whole hog, right? It's in the Bible somewhere. Uh, but you're going to go after whole hog, meaning you are going to really get on with the program. So when I look at how you give, I think of you this way, because I see how many people serve here in our church. But I'm talking about the financial giving, because you can tell a lot about a person's spirituality by how much they give to God, like how they approach giving to God. So just to recap, I sent you out a letter, I really sent out two letters in the last month, I'd say, uh, just about how amazing last year was. Because think of all the hurdles that we had to get through. There happened to be a virus, remember, that just made church attendance, it was great, it was not, it was great, it was not, it was not, it was great, it was, it was unbelievable. People were sick, families were sick, half my staff got the virus. So when you look at what we've been through as a church, uh, how we finished up the, the end of the year financially was just off the grid. Because I read what goes on in other churches what happened here was not normal. So with a, with a budget of uh, roughly 5.5 million, um, we ended up uh, receiving 5.6 million, uh, well over what we needed uh, for the stated budget. We also spent less than what we actually uh, took in. So uh, we were, I'm just gonna say we were blessed. And, and how were we blessed? Because the team gave. The team saw the vision. God wants a team to win, do great things inside the church, outside the church. Uh, and you equipped us to, to win. Uh, years ago, uh, Paul talked to Timothy, uh, another coach, an up-and-coming coach. As Paul was passing from the scene, he's training another coach how to, how to manage a team. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, this is what he says about giving. Paul says to Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be preoccupied or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. What happened last week with the stock market? Wasn't it exciting? No. Yeah, it's, it's kind of scary, isn't it? I was looking at some of the numbers, and I was crunching the numbers, and it's like, I lost $40,000 on the stock market. And I'm, I'm conservative in my approach. The, am I still here today? Am I alive? Am I happy? I'm trying to be. <laughs> you, can't place your, you can't place hope on the riches of the earth when you're trying to invest in things. 
Uh, and so you just know cost to income averaging, it'll pan out in the end. And in, in the end, I go to heaven anyway, so hey. Uh, but notice what he says to them. He says, uh, don't, don't trust in the uncertainty of riches, but, but trust on God. Put your trust on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And here comes the good part, verse 18. Instruct them, those, you know, people in your church, to do what? To do good, because by nature, uh, we have a hard time with that one. It says to do good and to be rich in good works, which is our church, and to be gracious. And he says, be generous, be generous, and, and be ready to share. When I look at our church and look at what happened last year, I just want to again say thank you. I am proud of you as a church. Uh, you, you saw the vision of what the church is doing. Uh, we're doing things that echo in eternity. Uh, we're touching our community. We're touching the world, uh, and you equipped us to do that. Um, I hired 16 new staff uh, last year uh, with the help of uh, our team uh, to pick the right people. That has blessed the staff, blessed the church. And so thank you for equipping us to do what God has called us to do. That's, that's my point, as you guys understand the, the importance of generosity. Um, now, moving on. Uh, based on the fact that we uh, added 85 new members last year, which was awesome, we also average about 40 new people per Sunday because I fill out all the visitors' cards. It's a commitment. You know what, you know, time management, how important it is? You don't know? Yes. Um, I know it's early. It's hard for you to talk. Just go with me. Um, I used to handwrite out each visitor card, like when I first got here. That became impossible. Uh, and so I finally switched to writing generic cards, what I want to say, and uh, for different kinds of people. And then I sign them and add a little personal thing at the end. So uh, I know how many visitors we're getting. So we're getting a ton of visitors every Sunday. And then they're coming back because they're hearing the word, they're seeing the people, they feel the love of Christ here, uh, et cetera. So my, my word to all those new people is you need to understand what the team has been doing and giving generously and understand the importance of doing that because God blesses that person that does that. Um, my first little lawn job that I did as a kid in the desert of Southern California, and I had this you know, first payment of lawn accounts, and my parents came to me, I was showing it to them, and, and I said, this is awesome. Look at how much I made out in the desert heat. And they're like, Oh, well, this part is God's. I'm like, what? And they said, yeah, that part's God. Like, how much? Well, at least 10%. Just take that off and take that over there for God. Me and my, you know, childhood naivete as a Christian back then said, but God wasn't out in the hot sun with me. But anyway, so I wouldn't say I was the best at learning about generosity. I've learned since the importance of being uh, generous. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul says, uh, he who sows sparingly shall also reap what? Sparingly. What's the flip side? There's an antithesis to that. He who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. So God blesses those who give generously. So why is there so much blessing on our church? Has been for years. It's because of giving. So thank you for being givers who also play hard on the team. Um, and the, if you're new on the team, uh, part of why we do what we do is because we give to God first. Uh, and then God blesses us. Number, question number two, uh, before we head out back onto the field. Uh, and it's 15 degrees playing this game. It was like the Rams game. Did you watch that? I'm sorry for mentioning them, but I am from California. But um, who can play football when, you, when your hand is frozen? I mean, it was just unbelievable. So we're going to head back out into the, the playing field, and I want you equipped. So question number two, uh, what is our core commitment uh, as a church? And there are many things we could talk about, but I've been thinking about this all year as I deal with it, as I confront it. Um, I, I, we need to, there's many things we can talk about, but this year I want us to really drill down into this particular core commitment. Um, we are committed to the owner, which is the Lord, uh, first and foremost, uh, and rightly so. And we're also committed to our neighbor, because those are the two greatest commandments, correct? Uh, Jesus said, Matthew 22, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind. Uh, and then he second, said the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So I can see that we love the Lord with intensity, with uh, the fact that our adult Sunday school classes that occur on Sunday mornings are standing room only. That's amazing. That's, the what, that's what should happen. Because you love the Lord, you want to learn about the Lord. How many children are in our children's program? How many workers are working there to teach them about the Lord? The amount of youth that come uh, on Sundays and during the week to our programs. I mean, just you look at our entire church, how many people are committed uh, to learning about God and then going out and doing things with what they're learning is amazing. Uh, baby bottles that are collected. I mean, anytime we do a fun drive, it's just you give to your neighbors to bless them. So that's, that is awesome. Those are core commitments. But I want to talk about the concept of truth, that we are committed to truth like never before. As churches become woke and cave on doctrine, 
What are we to be committed to? Truth. Truth. Uh, and so I want to talk to you for just a minute about just our core commitment to truth and how important that is. Carl Henry, uh, writing uh, back in uh, 1976, wrote these words, which are almost prophetic. Uh, imagine the day. I was just graduating from high school when he wrote this. It says, few times in history has, uh, has revealed religion and been forced to contend with such serious problems of truth and word. He says, never in the past, in the 70s, have the role of words and the nature of truth been a, a, as misty and as undefined as now. Boy, I'd say it's even worse now. It says, only if we recognize that the truth of truth is today in doubt and that its uncertainty stifles the word as a carrier of God's truth and moral judgment, do we fathom the depth of the present crisis? He says, when truth and the word remain as, as the accepted universe of discourse, then all aberrations can be challenged in the name of truth. Today, however, 1976, uh, the nature of truth and even the role of words is in dispute. I would say it has not improved in my lifetime. In fact, now truth is, well, whatever you want it to be. Uh, we live in a culture, uh, this, was, this was written 46 years ago, uh, where he was, he was saying, this is where we are now, but this is where we are going, and we have gone there big time. We are abandoning truth for the relative concept of truth. So if there is no absolute frame of reference of what is true, uh, and you accept that anything is true, uh, then everything is possible. I don't know if you've ever read the end of the book of Judges, a time of great sin and, and chaos. It says the last verse of the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. That is our culture. Um, there is no truth. There is no correspondence uh, view of truth. That truth corresponds to reality. Like I know there's a lectern here because it corresponds to reality, right? And I could pr produce certain uh, tests to demonstrate that it is here. It corresponds to reality. I would be foolish to assume, well, in my mind, I'm projecting that it is not there. Uh, imagine applying these truths to driving your vehicle. There would be wrecks uh, constantly because it was what's true to me that the right light was red, but it wasn't red. To, red means go to me, etc. It's a whole concept of no absolutes. And so uh, this has impacted our entire culture, politics, science, medicine, academia, the concept of truth. Uh, and we as a church have a sole responsibility uh, to be the salt and light to our culture concerning what is truth, especially spiritual and moral truth. Uh, because truth, by definition, never changes. Belief does. Remember when they used to believe that the earth was uh, flat, and if you sailed past uh, the Rock of Gibraltar and kept heading out, you'd just kind of go off. They drew dragons on the maps back then, that it's over for you. It's, you're just going to fall off. Well, they found out that the world was a sphere. So the belief system, though it was erroneous, did not change the truth, which never changes. Hey, I am a firm believer that the truth that God has built into the warp and woof of our world and built into the word of God never changes. We cannot modify it. We cannot waffle concerning it that we would be a church that teach, teaches God's core truth. And we shall be, is my, is my point. And we are. Uh, League Air Ministries uh, produces a state of theology report every year. It's kind of interesting to go through and read it because I was reading it this year. And it said that 54% of Americans believe that truth is relative. Which is erroneous about that particular statement is once you say that truth is relative, it cannot be absolute. You've proved that it's absolute because you just made an absolute statement about relativism. You follow me? So all fault systems implode by definition of faulty logic. Uh, and so 54% uh, of Americans are like, hey, man, if it's true to me, it's true to everyone. Right. Sure. Uh, now, what's positive about this is the year before, it was 60% of Americans believed that. So that's positive. Why? Because it's showing that what's going on in our culture, the chaos that you see, uh, which comes from the lack of moral absolute truth, spiritual truth, People are start, starting to dawn on them, we are going to disintegrate as a people, individually and, and nationally, if we don't embrace truth. And so that's going the other way. To that, I would say amen to that. You sound excited too. So uh, think about our, our culture. Everything is messed up when it comes to truth. Too. What do we teach our children about history? We change, what it, we change truth for ideology. What about sex and gender? We change truth. When you know your baloney meter goes off and you're like, huh. I know that's insane, because you know what truth is. You've never, you have a baloney meter? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I had to pay $40,000 to learn that in grad school, so the baloney meter, yeah. So let's think about truth. Um, 
Uh, writing around 681 BC, uh, Isaiah said this about truth. Now, this is the nation is going to face the judgment of God because they've abandoned truth. Isaiah chapter 59, he says to the nation who's sinning against the God of truth, for our transgressions are multiplied before thee. God knows your sin. That's the point. Our sins testify against us, for our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord, well, there's no evidence for God. You have no evidence for God, etc. And turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt. Because when we return away from God, oppression and revolt follow. He goes on to say, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words. Your culture becomes built around falsehood. Then he says, injustice is turned back. Because you can't have justice if you don't have truth, correct? Then he says, and righteousness stands far away. Why? For truth has stumbled in the street. And uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself prey. Like he just said, if you do wake up to the fact that you do need absolute truth, they hunt you and cancel you. You think the cancel culture is new? Do you? No, 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 no. It's been around for thousands of years. So you take a person like Isaiah, who was eventually canceled under the evil reign of Manasseh. Uh, history tells us that they put him in a log and cut the log in two. Um, he, he preached for 60 years. There is absolute truth. There is absolute spiritual moral truth, and you must turn to God and repent, and he will forgive you and bless your nation. And they didn't like what they heard, so they got rid of him. Did that deter him from him speaking what he needed to speak? No. Uh, I want to be Isaiah. I mean, in fact, my whole life I've tried to live after his footsteps. Jeremiah followed him. Jeremiah uh, prophesied uh, for 54 years uh, after Jeremiah, 627 B.C., um, he hits the planet, starts prophesying. He's, he's going to watch the nation implode because they won't embrace the truth of the reality of God when it comes to spirituality and morals. Chapter 5, notice what he says to his nation. Uh, speaking for God, he says, Rome to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. And look now and take note and seek in her open squares if you can find a man, if there is one who desires justice and who seeks truth. God says, find me one person who loves justice and truth. Then I will pardon her. I won't bring the Babylonians. And although they say, quote, uh, as the Lord lives, unquote, uh, surely, falsely, they swear. Uh, because they, they want God, but they deny the power of God. It says, O Lord, uh, do not thine eyes look for truth. Thou hast smitten them, but they don't, they, don't, they don't weaken. Thou hast consumed them, but they refuse to take correction. They made their faces harder than a rock. They refuse to repent. Is that not the culture which you see? God disciplines. He corrects. The chaos is hopefully waking them up. They will not repent. They turn to other false gods, false ways of life, reject God's existence, embrace any kind of immorality, call it morality. And he says they will not wake up. But, but Jeremiah says, God, verse 3, don't your eyes look for what? One thing. Don't your eyes look for truth? You know, I've been looking at Jeremiah all year. And in fact, I, because both my degrees are in the Old Testament, I've studied it many times. But I've been studying it throughout the year just for myself. And that verse means a ton to me as a shepherd because it tells me what I should be pursuing and then what you should be pursuing is what God looks for the most. And what's he look for? Truth. He looks for truth. Do you realize that we as a church are the final bastion of truth to the nation? It, it can't come from anywhere else. It has to come from the church. And so I pray for not just this church, but for churches, that God would use us to speak forth his truth unflinchingly uh, in said culture. How are we going to do that? Uh, well, that's a whole other question. So uh, I, I'm going to show you some charts. What would be a DC meeting without a chart? So I want to show you a little bit of how we're going to do this. Um, uh, so what we've done is we put together as a staff in a big meeting that we had at a retreat we took, uh, the core areas where we think truth is super important. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not important in other areas, but just what we're committed to like, like currently in a big way. So you can take the pie chart on the left, and you can see we're concerned about theology, systematic theology, uh, evangelism, uh, Bible exposition, discipleship, apologetics, how to defend the faith, uh, and then personal evangelism, how to, how to share your faith. So we're committed to those things. So that means when we put together our pedagogical structure as a church, it's not by happen chance. It's not willy-nilly. That we are, are sitting down and looking. These are our core values on the left side. And then in different areas, here is how we're going to cover them in the said year. Doesn't mean we're going to cover every single thing all of the time, but we want to know that we're doing it. Because what do guys, God's eyes look for? Truth. And so we as a church, like this is a Sunday uh, life training 
these are sp uh, specific areas. Like this is not going to be covered, but these area other areas are going to be covered. Um, here's another. Am I advancing my slides? Oh, I have another. Yeah, I have another slide. I thought I was advancing my slides. Did it change? Oh, yeah, it changed. Okay. So uh, here is another one. This is women's ministry. So they're not going to cover these areas this year, although they've covered them before. But they're going to highlight apologetics, like Mama Bear apologetics. Did some of you ladies take that? Guess not. It was an awesome class. Uh, <laughs> A discipleship, these are the things they're covering in there. Uh, Bible exposition, the bo books they're covering. So this is what they're hitting on this year. Uh, they're not going to hit everything, but they're going to hit some of them. And their, their whole Im impact of what they're doing when they put together a teaching structure, uh, what we call scope and sequence, is to focus on truth. What are people learning about truth that matters? Uh, so I'm going to continue to weave how to think about truth into sermons. Uh, I've put together um, uh, a talking point uh, document for uh, staff, uh, uh, which, which for, tells them what do I think are the major areas of truth, specific things that we need to know the argument of the opposition and what the answers are, we as truth tellers. And then that is, that is then taught to our people who teach so that when they get opportunity to teach truth about said concepts, we address those things because we're the voice of truth to said culture. And we are to be light and darkness. And so this helps us fulfill those things. So we are going to be, continue to remain uh, committed as a, as a team uh, to the concept of truth, no matter what that costs. You with me? I, I'm, with, I, I'm with you. And that's where we're going. Number three, uh, how's our team attitude? <laughs> Sorry, I have to ask this, but how is our attitude? If you played sports, attitude is everything, isn't it? I was on a football team one time when, when the score was 66 to 6, and we weren't winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We thought our linemen were big until we saw the other team. Mm -hmm. All I remember during that game, because I was a linebacker, I think, at that time, uh, all I remember of that game is, like, whenever our quarterback would go back to pass, he was enshrouded by red jerseys, and we were in blue. We were the Spartans. It was like, oh, he's not even getting no pass. They're not even a handoff. They just ran over our line. It was brutal. I must tell you that on the bench, it was not happy time. Because when something bad starts happening, you tend to kind of prey on each other. Uh, and instead of, you know, you know, being positive, the attitude just goes down. You ever been on a team like this where the attitude goes south? And, and so I want to tell you, when I, when I think about our team attitude, since we have so many wins uh, that God has, has given to us as a church, um, we have a great attitude here, but this is where the devil will attack. He will attack he knows we're, we're great on doctrine. He has many things in his bags of tricks. His bag of tricks. He'll, oh, oh, I can't attack him on doctrine. Well, then I'll, I'll attack their attitude. And so he attacks attitude. So I'm going to talk about attitude for just a moment. Um, in what way? Well, in, in this way. And I'm going to present 2 Timothy chapter 2 to you, which talks about attitude. Again, this is at the end of Paul's life. He's about to be uh, executed by Nero for his faith. Notice what he tells uh, Coach Timothy. He says, Coach Timothy, as you're coaching your team, your players, refuse foolish and ignorant speculations. Don't get bogged down in lame questions that go nowhere. Knowing they produce quarrels, you're just going to fight it with people. <laughs> Do you know how many questions I receive, like, I don't even, like, in a given month? From people that don't even go to church here anymore. You know, my mom's uncles, cousins, cousins, second cousins, friend, goes to your church and said you might know the answer to this question. Huh? <laughs> So I, I get all kinds of questions all the time. You know, and sometimes it's like, viable question? Oh, I don't know about that one. And I think I, I'd rather call you on this one than the, the, write this whole thing out. I mean, it's just, it happens all the time. So what would be like a foolish, ignorant speculation? I don't know, Pastor, I'm just kind of wondering how many angels <laughs> can fit on the head of a pin? Guess what? Lame. I'm not answering that, you know? I mean, does it really matter? Does that matter? No, it doesn't matter. So some questions are foolish and ignorant, and sometimes they're asked to set you up as the coach so that it can produce a quarrel or between you as people. And, and Paul says when you're playing, you know, kind of learn the difference between a viable question and one that's really just meant to fight. And he says, and the Lord's bondservant, that's the player, must not be quarrelsome. If you think that is your spiritual gift, we need to talk. Uh, but be, notice what he says, be kind. Only the people that you like and that agree with you. Now, be kind to who? All, all, all able to teach 
truth to them. And this is, a, this is hard. Patient when wrong. Patient when wrong. Uh, there's more. Then he says, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Why? If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the, what? Truth. And they may come to their senses, because they're, they're in a stupor of falsity, and escape from the snare of the devil, and having been held captive by him to do his will. This is, this is amazing. What's your attitude when you take the truth of God and you engage said culture? Is it, is it combative and quarrelsome? Then that's not of God. See, that's the tendency of the church. It feels like we're losing because the, the darkness is doing so many things that are like off the grid. So it may feel like you're losing, but you may get desperate and do things that you shouldn't do as a player. Paul says, but make sure you're not quarrelsome. Be kind and gentle. Let's just focus on the one to, to be gentle. You know, when you get that email that you don't like or that phone call from somebody, and or, or you're laughing, <laughs> and you know how you, you want to respond, give it a day. I'm saying, just give it a day. Some, give it a couple of days. Just relax, think about it, think about your answer, etc. Then engage in a, what kind of format? Kind and gentle. Because if you do it right away, I am going to set them straight. That's my cousin. He's hounded me forever. He's an atheist. Hey, this is it. Don't do it. What are you supposed to do? Are you listening to me? Kind and gentle. Kind and gentle. How easy is it to do those two things? It's, it's not. It's really not. And I speak from experience. I, I know how, how hard it is. But may God make us a church that's not only committed to truth, but we're committed to truth as two beggars looking for bread. And we happen to have found the bread. And you're just taking another beggar and telling him, hey, man, I, I know where it is. And you do it in a kind, gentle way. Uh, this is what Paul did on Mars Hill. He's moseying on around. He's got some time to kill. He, it's awesome. Read, read Acts 17. He goes up to Mars Hill, the academia, intelligentsia, life of Greece. He takes on the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers there because they have thousands of idols, and one of them says, to the unknown God. Just in case we missed one, this covers them. Paul's looking at that going, eh, I know who that is. He's the God of all. And so he presents that on Mars Hill in a nice way. And they mock him and insult him, and they, they call him in Greek a seed picker, like a bird seed picker. That just You're just picking up little bits of philosophy around the world and melding them into this new theology. That's insanity. You're not as smart as we are. But it tells you, after they got done mocking them, because they really went off the grid when he shared about the resurrection of Christ. They just lost it. But it says in Acts 17, 33, so when he was done, Paul went out of their midst, but some men from the intelligentsia joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them that only the Lord knows. Isn't this amazing? He engaged them in a loving, kind way. And what did the Lord Jesus do? He saved some of those because they saw the blindness and error of their way. They embraced the truth of the, the resurrection of Christ, and they're in heaven because Paul walked to Mars Hill. So I have to ask you, what is your attitude when you go to Mars Hill? Secondarily, who's going to be your uh, Dionysius this next year? Who will be your Damaris? Because you kindly and gently showed them truth. And I have one more question before we leave and go back out onto the field. And I have two minutes. How's our team cohesion? I mean, how's the team cohesion? I mean, are we hanging together? Because in Matthew, or in the John 17, before Christ was crucified, his high priestly prayer, he prayed that we would be unified as the, as the Trinity is unified. That's his prayer. Do you think Jesus' prayers are fulfilled? I do. Because he, he's God. So he prayed for our unity, but in the practical, our unity can be tested. But I would say, uh, uh, first and foremost, that I believe that we are uh, continuing to be a unified church. True, there are things here that need to be helped and modified and coached and uh, things to be admonished and you know, relationships repaired. But by and large, we are a very unified body. But we must be very careful that the devil can attack this area. Because he's... He, if he's not going to come after doctrine, he's going to come after your attitude. If he's not going to come after your attitude, well, then I'll just mess with the team. You know, th I'll get this person to offend that person, and they'll never talk to each other again, etc. So how do you make sure that you have, a, as we go forward, a team that really hangs together no matter what? Well, I would submit to you that we constantly, collectively as a team, give time and attention daily to all of the one another commands of the New Testament. This is a whole sermon series, by the way. There's a ton of one another commands, not suggestions. 
as you commit to those, then there's team cohesion and the devil can't get in. Here's some of the commands. Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Wow. Be devoted to each other. If I'm devoted to somebody as a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, what does that mean? What does it mean? You need to answer that question. If I am devoted to them, I will be with them. I will hang out with them. I will talk to them. I will call them. I will email them. They can count on me. It was like a brother. I will be there for you. And I will honor them in how I talk to them. Um, Romans 12, 16 says, be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Uh, do, don't, do not be wise in your own estimation. I mean, don't think you're all that in a bag of chips. You're not. You know, he says, don't, don't think because you're the senior pastor that you're over everybody and that you're just all that. I'm not. I'm, I'm a servant just like you of Christ, right? And uh, don't think because you have more degrees than somebody else or you've done more uh, than others that, you, that you're so much superior. No, no, you're just two servants of Christ. So he says, be of the same mind toward each other and don't, don't be arrogant in your mind. Well, I do this, therefore you are below me. No, no, we're all servants of Christ and he came to be a servant and we're to be of his mindset, correct? We're supposed to do what he did as he served us. Um, there's a ton of these. I'll just read a couple more. Um, Romans uh, 14, 19. So let us pursue the things which make for peace and for building up one another. Did you hear me? Let us, let us pursue the things which make for peace and for the building up one another. So when you serve in a different area of the church, is there peace because you're there? Or is it all messed up because you're there and you're blaming other people that it's messed up because you won't own up to the fact you created the chaos? I pastored 32 years. I've seen it all. And give you illustrations for all set points. So I merely submit to you, do you truly build up a children's ministry where you work, the youth ministry where you work, the small group that you lead? Do you build up the body? Because that is what we are called to do because that brings peace and stability to the body. That is your main thing, not to blast the body, but to build up the body. Do you do that? Do you do that? Um, I like Ephesians 4.1. He says this, uh, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling by which you are called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Be patient with each other. Oh, see how this is a sermon? I can think of all the reasons why you would not want to be patient with somebody. Why? Can you think of some? Why wouldn't you want to be patient with somebody? Why aren't you talking now? See, it's like I'm saying, yeah, you know, they don't think as fast as I do. They have weird idiosyncrasies that really bug me. They're moody. They're up and down. I can never predict them, etc. The minute you say, Lord, as I as a team player, give me a whole lot of patience in 20. 22 for the entire team that's a scary prayer to pray but god may i be patient with others because there's lots of reasons why you would not be patient i'll give you one sport illustration we had a drill where you had to when the coach moroni blew the whistle you all had to run when he called the team and line up on uh like the 25 yard line like the punt return team and the kickoff team. i mean all these teams so he'd boop we'd all run out if any guy was out of place it was a 75 yard wind sprint in full gear you wanted to line up correctly. One day, we did 75 wind, 75 yard wind sprints because we messed up that many times. <laughs> did you hear me? 75 yard wind sprints in full gear at the end of practice in the desert heat. And primarily it was one guy and I'll never forget his name. <laughs> I won't tell you his last name, but I'll tell you his first name. His name was Joaquin. See, I grew up on the border. All my, most of my friends are Hispanic. It was Joaquin. Every time people do this, you're in the wrong spot. So after we ran those 75-yard wind sprints, we did that, which was not Christian. Because as we're walking back, you know, to the, to the showers as a team, and there was about, I don't know, like 40 of us, we saw Joaquin. It was not a group hug. Let's put it that way. It was the biggest dog pile seen in human history to help Joaquin understand when the whistle blows, you get in your spot. Now, I wouldn't say we're a team like that, right? No blowing the whistles, dogpiling on anybody. But to be patient with the Joaquins who quite can't get their act together, be patient with them. And then lastly, Galatians 5, he's, for 13, he says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into the opportunity of the flesh, but through love serve one another. Serve one another. This is the servantest church I've ever seen. It's, it's unbelievable, the level of service. 
But I want to show to you the importance uh, of you being tied into our church because I'm going to list the areas of service. So if you think, the big church, I'm sure all things covered, they don't need me, uh, you just thought wrong. Uh, here is where God would have you step into the body and serve. So I close with this. Worship arts needs. What do they need? It's in English. Computer slide operator, right? Video camera operator, light operator. Uh, they need you. And they'll train you. Uh, care center needs a ton of them. English as a second language teachers and assistants. Employment ministry that they're trying to get off the ground. They can train you to help you to help people find jobs. There's more. Uh, financial counselors. They're looking for people to train people in how to manage their finances because a lot of people don't know how to do it. Go uh, the 222 conference volunteers. They need a ton of people to help us with that mission outreach. You want to step in there? They need you. Uh, remember, serve one another, Paul says. Operations needs. Uh, the safety team to guard our facility when we're here. Uh, they, they need security and medical people. Shuttle van drivers to run the shuttle vans. Coffee team. Boy, that's important. Uh, the Nook, the bookstore, volunteers to run it. Would you step into any of those places? Prayer ministry needs. We have a huge prayer ministry here. Sunday mornings, they need people. Tuesday evenings, they need people. Daily Zoom prayer. They got 40 to 45 men. I, what are they there at? Five o'clock in the morning? Six, six? Six. It's early. God is up, and they pray. But they can use more people to pray. And by the way, we've done what we've been able to do because people are getting up and praying, by the way. Uh, women's ministry needs. Uh, they need a breakaway coordinator for next fall. Uh, women are needed to lead our Moms in Hope support group. That, this could be you. Uh, they need somebody for a nonfiction book club to lead that. Uh, life group needs. Uh, there's 45 groups with 700 people in them, but we need more life group leaders for more groups for body life. Uh, you want to lead a group? Uh, adult special needs. Uh, they're trying to get an adult special needs program off the ground. It's going to take a lot of volunteers. Those are, these are the areas where they need people to get this off the ground. Because we have a thriving one for the young children, but we need more. So they need regular adult volunteers for special need adults. They need lead teachers. They need a worship leader uh, to lead those special needs adults. Uh, is that you? Uh, they need uh, to provide training uh, uh, for people uh, to, to understand the importance of that ministry. They will train you. They need buddies for children in the special needs ministry for the children. Uh, they need volunteers to help with respite nights, which we had to cancel Friday because snowstorm. But we had, I think, 31 special needs children coming here uh, with their parents uh, to be ministered to while the parents could go, like, have a date. And I have a special needs child who's now a man, but I understand the importance of respite. Uh, could you help in that area? Children's ministry needs, they need welcome team members. They need preschool leads and assistants. They need a VBS uh, decor coordinators. Are you artistic and able to make set designs? They need you. Uh, student ministry needs, they're very specific, aren't they? Only in D.C., three. We need three. Female life group leaders. We need one male life group leader. We need two female life group leaders for middle school. Uh, you got time to invest in young people? Uh, student ministry needs. Uh, there's many more needs in our church. So those are our basic needs. What did Paul say in Galatians? Serve one another. How do I do that? This is how you do that. And if, if you don't know where that is that you might be able to serve, then say, God, wh where would you put me in that list? This will be online tomorrow if you want to look at it. You should get plugged in because you are a player on God's team, and, and he's looking for you to use your gifts to benefit the team. So uh, halftime's over. In fact, halftime's way over. Uh, we got to get out on the field. Now, I don't know. Did your football team have a chant? This is the weirdest church I've ever been to. You know, you're thinking, man, yeah, it's a chant. You know, it's like, you know, what are the name of you? Like, ours was a Spartan. It's like, go Spartans, go Spartans. You know what I'm saying? Ours is BCC, right? I know, it's hokey. It's all I could go with. Ours is BCC. BCC! Oh, you sound motivated. Yes! So, so while you're pumped up with that adrenaline from that chant, which needs some help, uh, uh, may God bless you. It's great, great being your shepherd. Uh, and may God bless our church in the next year to do great things for him. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, to be able to have a chalk talk uh, about important things which uh, matter to you. Uh, protect us from our adversary. May we be wise concerning his ways. May we be wise concerning the things that we are uh, called to do this year. And may we be loyal and devoted to the things that matter most to you. And we thank you for just the opportunity you've given us to be the light where we are in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.